The Committee on Homeland Security Subcommittee on Oversight and Management Efficiency will come to order. The purpose of this hearing is to examine findings of a recent Government Accountability Office or GAO report on employee misconduct at the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Before we begin, the Chair would like to welcome our new member, the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Ron Estes, to the subcommittee. He brings a wealth of experience from the private sector and as Kansas State Treasurer, Treasurer that will be invaluable as the subcommittee examines DHS operations. The Chair now recognizes himself for an opening statement. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, provides Americans invaluable support during times of great need. FEMA leads federal efforts to prepare for, respond to, and recover from disasters. To accomplish this enormous task, FEMA relies on a workforce of over 22,000 dedicated men and women, which includes both permanent and disaster-related temporary employees. Often, FEMA employees are among the first responders helping lift up communities, communities devastated by loss and destruction. The American people entrust FEMA's employees with this vital mission, which is why instances of employee misconduct are all the more corrosive and concerning. A year-long review by the Government Accountability Office uncovered troubling instances of employee misconduct and found several areas where FEMA must improve its management of misconduct matters. GAO, GAO analyzed data from January 2014 through September 2016 and identified almost 600 misconduct complaints. The most common alleged misconduct dealt with issues of integrity and ethics. Examples include a female employee allegedly taking illegal gifts from contractors, a terminated FEMA employee stealing a FEMA-owned laptop, and allegations of a supervisor bullying and cursing at employees. A separate GAO review in 2016 found that four FEMA employees being investigated for personnel matter matters were placed on a paid administrative leave for a year or more at a cost to taxpayers of over $600,000. In addition, FEMA failed to properly investigate several allegations referred to re correction, referred by the DHS Office of Inspector General, leaving them to languish without investigation or resolution. GAO also criticized FEMA for its poor data tracking of misconduct cases, which limited its ability to analyze trends in employee mis misconduct over time. GAO concluded that FEMA's management of the misconduct process needs sustained improvement despite hundreds, correction, despite hundreds of misconduct allegations against FEMA's workforce, FEMA lacks documented misconduct policies and procedures for its surge capacity force and has not outlined disciplinary actions or the appeals process for its reservist workforce. Together, these employees total over half of FEMA's total workforce. Additionally, FEMA does not instruct its workforce on the range of offenses and penalties that they might face if misconduct occurs. Everybody's got to know what the, you know, what the recipe is, what the, you know, what the rules of the game are, right? Although many agencies utilize a table of offenses and penalties to guide disciplinary actions, which would inform everybody, FEMA uses a comparator spreadsheet that is only shared on a case-by-case -case basis with supervisors. This spreadsheet replaced a previous used table that had not been updated since 1981. That's a long time, man. Such an, such an approach most certainly leads to inconsistencies in how discipline is administer administered across FEMA's regions. Legislation put forward by subcommittee member Clay Higgins, H.R. 2131, the DHS Firm Act, would require DHS components, including FEMA, to utilize a table of offenses and penalties to improve consistency with discipline across DHS. GAO's report provides FEMA's new leadership an opportunity to make important changes that will improve the integrity of FEMA's workforce. I'm encouraged by FEMA's concurrence with the GAO's six recommendations and its plans to refocus on improving the agency's management. Americans from all corners of the nation simply rely on FEMA during their darkest hours. We need the men and women of FEMA focused on that critical mission of lifting up our citizens facing disheartening times. I look forward to hearing how FEMA will improve on the deficiencies laid out in GAO's report and reaffirm its commitment to the integrity of its workforce. 
The chair now recognizes the ranking minority member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from California, my friend, Mr. Lou Correa, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Perry, and thank you for holding this most important hearing on a very important topic. The FEMA workforce has a very important and critical responsibility, and that is to support our citizens and first responders as they face some of the most crippling natural disasters this country has ever seen. They assess first responders and in many cases are the first responders. FEMA employees risk their lives for the good of the country as a whole and for this we thank you. The FEMA workforce exemplifies the DHS mission statement which is with honor and integrity we will safeguard the American people, our homeland and our values. At the Aspen Institute last week, Secretary Kelly co commended the patriotism, dedication, and focus of the DHS workforce as they protect the nation even in the face of very dangerous missions. Today's hearing starts from a GAO report released last week that concluded that FEMA should improve the manner in which it documents and communicates policies related to employee conduct, a task that is administrative in nature. Uh, but uh, witnesses, I would say, is this really the conclusion? Uh, employees, whether full-time, part-time, or temporary, should know and understand an agency's policies regarding misconduct, as well as the availability of the rights to challenge or appeal adverse decisions. While misconduct must be addressed and not tolerated, wherever it occurs in the workforce, <clears throat> does the GAO report actually say that FEMA has an integrity or misconduct problem. That requires improvement. Again, we must never tolerate such behavior. In fact, I believe the report makes it clear that allegations of misconduct made against FEMA employees uh, are less than 2% of the entire FEMA workforce. Is that the case? Additionally, one of the FEMA employee categories highlighted in the report, search capacity force members has recorded zero cases of misconduct, according to FEMA officials. The second class of FEMA employees discussed in the report, reservists, are at will and intermittent employees. The second class of employees are not hired under Title V and do not receive the same protections of a collectively bargained contract, such as the right to appeal adverse actions, including suspensions or terminations. Again, I ask, what is the scope of the misconduct? Also, is morale an issue for FEMA? Measuring morale, FEMA is ranked 284th out of 305 AG agency subcomponents, which means that the agency index scores fall well below average. The FEMA workforce expressed dissatisfaction with agency leadership, their fairness of performance reviews, and opportunities for professional development. Research shows that effective leadership is a key driver of employee satisfaction. And in order to improve employee morale, FEMA must provide robust training to new supervisors, motivate and engage employees, and recognize, of course, high performers. Very proud that this Congress and this committee have passed legislation to focus on improving morale and employee engagement at the department. And today I look forward to discussing with the witnesses today how this committee can continue to engage 22,000 full-time, part-time, and volunteer FEMA personnel to help improve morale. I'd also like to again thank the workforce for your contributions. You have not been ignored. Uh, to the witnesses, I would ask, what does your data show? FEMA has been around since, I believe, 1979. What is the history of misconduct? Are there any patterns compared to who, to other agencies, to FEMA? We can always do better. What does this study tell us? Finally, Mr. Chair, I yield back to you. Chair, thanks to gentlemen. Other members of the subcommittee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. We are pleased to have two distinguished panels of witnesses before us today.
The witnesses' entire written statements will appear in the record. The chair will introduce the first panel of witnesses and then recognize each of you for your testimony. Mr. David Grant is FEMA's acting deputy administrator. Prior to this position, he served as FEMA's associate administrator for mission support, as well as the chief procurement officer. Prior to joining FEMA, Mr. Grant was chief of agency-wide shared services of the, for the Internal Revenue Service. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Welcome. Mr. Chris Curry is a director in GAO's Homeland Security and Justice team, where he leads the agency's work on DHS management, emergency management, national preparedness, and critical infrastructure protection issues. Prior to this position, he served as an acting director in GAO's Defense Capabilities and Management team, where he led reviews of Department of Defense programs. Mr. Curry, thank you, and we appreciate your service as well. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Grant for your opening statement. And if you can, Mr. Grant, just push the button, make sure the mic is yes, sir. right at your mouth. Can you hear me clearly, sir? Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Perry, Ranking Member Correa, and members of the committee. As you said, my name is Dave Grant. I am FEMA's acting deputy director and uh, deputy administrator, excuse me, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. This morning, I'd like to provide an overview of our efforts to address the Government Accountability Office, or GAO's, performance audit of FEMA's process for handling allegations of employee misconduct. The GAO report does recognize that FEMA has effective and efficient misconduct policies and procedures for its employees, and I appreciate that. Although we agree that we need to do a better job in documenting those procedures, and we have already begun to do so. FEMA documents its cases and outcomes to ensure a timely adjudication, verify that FEMA complies with all legal requirements to treat our employees in a fair and equitable manner, and for auditing purposes. FEMA also has a process through which misconduct data is shared with Homeland Security's uh, Inspector General. The vast majority of FEMA's personnel serve effectively and honorably, and I appreciate you both recognizing that. They provide critical assistance to communities in their time of greatest need. In those rare instances when a FEMA employee or an individual representing FEMA is accused of misconduct, FEMA takes immediate action to, addresses, to address those allegations. Under Stafford Act authorities, FEMA has created unique policies and procedures for taking disciplinary actions against Stafford Act employees when required and necessary. The Stafford Act affords FEMA the latitude to devise disciplinary processes outside those requirements of Title V. Those allow those cases to be quickly initiated, reviewed, and finalized. FEMA employs an appeals process for those Stafford Act cases to confirm that the appropriate action was taken when misconduct has occurred, ensuring that they are subject to a fair and equitable process. While FEMA does not have written policies and procedures specifically addressing the surge capacity workforce that you mentioned a moment ago, management is empowered to take necessary actions to address the misconduct following FEMA's existing policies and procedures that apply to FEMA personnel. With regard to surge capacity personnel, it is important to note that they are not FEMA employees. FEMA does not have the authority to take disciplinary action regarding those individuals because they remain officially employed by their sponsoring federal agencies while engaged in activities on our behalf. The sponsoring agency is responsible for appropriate disciplinary action against those personnel. For our Title V employees, FEMA has made significant strides in documenting and improving our policies and procedures, including the creation of an administrative investigation directive and manual to delineate the process for receiving and adjudicating the complaints of misconduct, sending those complaints as appropriate to the DHS Inspector General, and direct misconduct investigations within FEMA. This directive is currently being reviewed and updated, and we expect it to be completed by December of this year. Although FEMA has an effective misconduct process in place for Title V and Stafford Act employees, the GAO recommended that FEMA take additional steps to clarify the process. GAO report makes several recommendations, including the documentation of policies and procedures related to FEMA's surge capacity force, its disaster force, and to clearly communicate misconduct policies, including consequences and appeals process. The GAO also recommended that FEMA work to improve the quality and usefulness of its misconduct data that it collects, and once that quality is improved, conduct routine reporting on misconduct trends. FEMA wholeheartedly agrees with each of those six recommendations, and we have already initiated several lines of effort that will address those concerns when fully implemented. I want to assure you that FEMA is committed to effective support of our citizens and our first responders during disasters and emergencies. That is our mission. We take it very seriously. 
The overwhelming majority of our workforce serves honorably and effectively. We are committed to investigating all allegations of misconduct and to appropriately hold those individuals accountable. One instance of substantiated misconduct is one too many. FEMA takes these allegations seriously. We look forward to working with the committee, with our partners at GAO, our partners in the Inspector General's office to improve our practice. I thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grant. The Chair and I recognize Mr. Curry for his opening statement. Sir? Thank you, Chairman Perry. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Correa and other members of the subcommittee that are here today. Um, I'd like to summarize the report we issued just last week on FEMA misconduct. I'll try not to duplicate um, too much of what was already mentioned in the summary of the opening statements. Um, to be clear, any amount of misconduct in any agency is, is never a good thing. Uh, in, FEM in FEMA's case, as was discussed, um, its full-time and reserve employees interact with state and local first responders and officials and citizens during times of extreme stress and vulnerability. Misconduct by its employees can not only hamper FEMA's mission, but also damage the agency's reputation. We all saw how quickly public trust can be lost after Hurricane Katrina in 2005, and how long it takes to rebuild it. However, cases of employee misconduct exist at every agency. That's why it's so important that agencies have procedures to address it quickly, take consistent disciplinary action, and have the systems needed to monitor misconduct across the entire agency, especially one as large as FEMA. Now, to quickly summarize our report, first I'd like to discuss the numbers and the types of cases we saw at FEMA. Second, I'll summarize our assessment of FEMA's policies and process for handling these cases. First, we identified, as the chairman noted, about 600 misconduct cases at FEMA from January 2014 to September 2016. That's about three-year time period across an agency of uh, 20,000 employees, give or take uh, which workforce is included in that number. The most common cases related to integrity and ethics violations, inappropriate conduct, and misuse of government funds. For example, uh, one alleged case involved a FEMA employee in the field accepting illegal gifts from a contractor. Um, other cases involve more internal issues such as supervisor harassment and favoritism. The data showed that misconduct was most common among FEMA's part-time reservists, and the agency took a range of disciplinary actions in these cases. The most common disciplinary action was removal or termination, followed by reprimands and various levels of suspension. And while these cases are always shocking to hear, agencies send a clear message when they have strong processes, controls, and systems to handle them quickly and effectively. And we found a number of areas where we think FEMA could improve in this area. For example, we found that while FEMA had disciplined policies for many of its employees, it had no policies for reservists. And that's about 7,000 uh, employees at the agency. FEMA also had not developed a table of offenses and penalties to communicate to employees. We also found FEMA's misconduct data and systems for tracking cases, frankly, was, was a bit messy. Uh, for example, various internal FEMA offices maintained information in different formats, making it very difficult to track cases and identify trends across the whole agency. We recommended that FEMA improve its data and better report on these trends. We also identified problems in FEMA's process for sharing and following up on cases referred from the DHS Office of Inspector General. I think it's important to understand this process. DHS policy requires components like FEMA to send serious misconduct cases to the IG. The IG then determines whether they want to investigate it or not. The IG typically handles the more serious cases, such as criminal or those involving very senior staff, such as senior executive service officials and refers the rest back to FEMA for internal investigation. What we found is that FEMA sometimes missed cases referred from the IG. We took a random sample of these cases and found a number of them uh, where there was no follow-up investigation conducted. Now, after we alerted FEMA, they did follow up and adjudicate the cases. So we recommended that they work with the IG to, to strengthen that whole process. As Mr. Grant noted, and to FEMA's credit, uh, they've agreed with all of our recommendations and are taking action to address them. For example, uh, they're working to document discipline policies for reservists now and plan to communicate a table of offenses and penalties to
to all the agency staff. FEMA is also working with the IG to develop a new case management system to clean up the data and better ensure reconciliation of cases. This concludes my statement, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Curry. And now we'll go into questions uh, from, from the members. Um, and I'll recognize myself first uh, to ask uh, the first series of questions. And we'll go through the, the five-minute time period uh, for each member as well. Mr. Grant, um, the, you know, the reservist program manual currently does not include information on the disciplinary process or appeals rights for reservists. I, is that part of what FEMA is planning to add to the manual as part of this review? Uh, yes, sir. Um, the uh, reservist misconduct uh, policies and procedures will be updated to include disciplinary actions and the appeals. Uh, we intend to issue that by December 31st of this year. Thank you. Uh, what, again, for Mr. Grant, what is FEMA doing to ensure the misconduct and discipline are handled consistently across its workforce categories or regions or different field offices? Uh, well, as Mr. Curry um, correctly noted, uh, we do have some inconsistent uh, systems. We currently maintain three different systems from three different offices, Office of Chief Counsel, Office of Chief Security Officer, and Labor Relations within the Chief Human Capital Office. Those three organizations meet weekly to discuss the various caseloads. The, the, uh, the problems could come into any one of those groups, and then they meet every week to discuss and make sure that nothing slips through the crack. Those issues that are raised uh, to the level of the Inspector General are reported by Chief Security Officer to the IG. As Mr. Curry indicated, they make the decision whether or not they will investigate and they return them to us. We did note that six of those cases that they found were not uh, appropriately investigated by us in a timely manner. We have subsequently taken that uh, under advisement and, and fixed that problem, uh, and we don't believe that, that that problem will occur again. The other issue that we're doing, which Mr. Curry noted and I appreciate, is that we are partnering with the IG to actually adopt their system, their IT system, their case management system. Um, they have given us the system. We have deployed it in our test environment to determine whether or not it will operate in the FEMA network. And if it will, we, we hope that it will, that testing should be done by October, then we will deploy it within the chief security officer as a pilot. If that then works, then we will deploy it across our enterprise and it will become a singular system with common nomenclature, common case management numbers so that uh, one of the issues that uh, the GAO recognized was that um, having a, a singular case number system to go up to the IG and back would allow us to track every case to completion. We don't have that today. We don't have common nomenclature between the three systems, and that's what causes us to then have a manual conversation every week. So we try and manage it manually. We think by deploying the IG's system, that will enable us to fix much of the problem uh, the GAO raised. It, it does seem that it would be much more logical to have that one system that you could work from and, and be consistent across offices as well as yes, uh, tracking. Uh, Mr. Curry, you know, in 2006, uh, you know, FEMA ranked 284th out of the 305 agencies uh, in terms of best places to work. And can you talk a little bit about what you may have observed in terms of uh, what's the cause of this or, or what practices might be improved? Yes, sir. Well, first of all, we, we look at morale across all of the Department of Homeland Security and all of the components. It's, it's a key reason that the departmental management is still on GAO's high risk list. Um, and it's, it's very, very important. You cannot separate the morale of the employees from the mission of the organization. Those two are tied together. They're not separate things. Um, we have um, been very interested in watching FEMA's progress in this area. Um, I, I'm not sure I have a, a reason, per se, for the low morale. Um, we've looked at their recent plans they've put together to increase employee engagement. One of the key reasons that, that FEMA itself has cited is, frankly, a lack of, of trust um, of upper-level leadership. Um, and so, uh, in a, in, and that's much higher, actually, than trust of immediate supervisors. So um, I think uh, the morale issue feeds directly into that. Uh, employees want to know that other employees are being held accountable and that their leaders are, are playing fairly and following the rules. And uh, I think having uh, stronger uh, misconduct policies and procedures and communicating those will, will help that. All right. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm about out of time here, so I will uh, turn the question over to Ranking Member Correa. Thank you, uh, Chairman Estes. I just wanted to follow that line of questioning, and uh, I think Chair is absolutely uh, onto something, which is morale and misconduct. And Mr. Curry, you just said there's lack of, of trust in upper level management. And if I pull back and think about FEMA, as I mentioned earlier, you're effectively first responders, and your workplace is a challenging one. When you're called to respond to a disaster, you encounter things that are very difficult to work with, and you do your job, and I would imagine you do it with honor, and that's why you continue to do what you do. Yet if you have a, a lack of morale, that tells me that there's something there that's not connected. Lack of trust in upper management. Also, issue misconduct. You want to know that the person that you're working next to is an honorable individual. So I would ask both of you, um, misconduct, percentage-wise, FEMA's been around since 1979. Is this a pattern that has exploded, has stayed level, has this gone up or down? What are the percentages of, of you know, levels of misconduct or categories? Mentioned um, laptop missing. Uh, a person taking a gift from a contractor. Um, how many times do you have this happen percentage-wise? Um, personnel issues, somebody gets mad at their you know, coworker and files a complaint. Give me a picture, I wanna see what these numbers are actually telling us. Open it up. If you don't mind, Mr. Curry, sure. I'll take the first uh, stab at answering that. Thank you very much for the question. Um, as you noted earlier in your opening statement, sir, um, less than 2%, about a little over 1% of our staff um, have been alleged to have this kind of misconduct. Uh, as I, as I Le mentioned- So less than 1% are no, complaints? No, le less than 2% of the, of the folks have had a complaint. Uh, what we have gone- Lodged back, against them. Yes. Okay. And then we've gone back and looked at what I call how it's been adjudicated. And that turns out to be slightly less than 50% of those that have been alleged actually. About 2%, then about 1% are actually substantiated. A little less than 1%. Less than 1%, okay. So I want to make two points. Number one, I'm actually encouraged by a number of complaints because I think that sends the message that employees feel safe and free to lodge a complaint. I don't want employees to feel as though they are inhibited from lodging a complaint or a question. I want them to feel free to go to management, to the... To so what you do, create an 800 anonymous yeah, number, or we, what We actually you? do. Uh, one of the questions I had in preparing for this hearing was, how do employees, I wanted to validate and look at it myself, how do employees lodge such a, a complaint? Uh, we have that as an icon on our uh, chief security officer webpage. I asked, to be, asked for it to be moved to the front page of the FEMA intranet site. I want every employee to have access to that. We also have annual training such as the No Fear Act where every employee is made aware that they can contact the DHS IG hotline directly or contact labor relations or contact their supervisor or contact uh, chief security officer. So we want the complaint to come in. We want to follow the process to adjudicate it. We hope that they are not substantiated, but when they are, then we want to follow a consistent, quick process to, um, uh, to take care of the problem and issue uh, discipline as required. So again, the pattern has been complaints going up or down or steady? I would say they've been fairly steady. Uh, it depends on the kind of, uh, of uh, system. Uh, so would you kind of say issue. that based on your new policy of encour encouraging folks to come forward, the actual number of complaints has remained steady or again pattern well, is? Well, again, that's just recent in preparation for this hearing that we moved it to the front page. Um, so I would expect, again, that the number of complaints coming in doesn't concern me as much as those that are substantiated. What we have seen is about two-thirds or three-quarters of one percent of our population would have a substantiated issue against them. Uh, and those are the issues, and, and as I said in my opening statement, one I issue of, of substantiated misconduct is one too many. We don't like that. We don't tolerate it. And as you indicated in your statement, that causes a morale issue because if I'm sitting next to someone who I think is getting away with something like that, that could be an issue. I don't want people thinking about that. As the chairman said in his opening, opening statement, when we're out in the field, these are stressful times. These are communities 
These are survivors who are having potentially the worst day of their life. They want to know that they have the full focus and attention of our staff. And as I said in my opening statement, the vast majority of our employees serve honorably and with distinction in very difficult circumstances mm -hmm. with, with a lot of tension. And they handle it well. And those cases that do happen, we want to handle it consistently. We want to handle it quickly. And we want to remove those individuals or put them in a place where they can be educated better and understand that what they just did is not tolerated. And then we'll bring them back in. Mr. Chair, I yield. Thank you, Mr. Correa. And now I'd like to call on Ms. Rice for five minutes. Uh, I think uh, this administration has made it very clear through hiring freezes, reductions to employee retirement programs, and just overall budget cuts um, that the federal worker is just simply not a priority for this administration. And so we can talk about morale all we want, but when the government that you work for doesn't support you, I can't imagine a worse situation in terms of morale. Um, so to what extent does the administration's clear attempt to shrink the workforce, the federal worker workforce, um, what does that have on their ability to do their job, number one, and the morale of the agency overall? And that's for both of you. Mm -hmm. Well, ma'am, we um, at GAO, we have not analyzed the recent efforts to try to reduce or streamline the federal workforce. But I can say this in, in terms of Department of Homeland Security and FEMA um, and all agencies across government, um, you know, everybody in, in government, all departments are operating under the same environment, have been for a long time. And, and we assess employee morale and engagement using several different factors and criteria. Um, what we've seen is that agencies that have high morale uh, exercise certain behaviors that, that lead to that morale being higher than other agencies. Um, so in, in FEMA's case, uh, as, as the chairman noted opening up, um, they have tended to be lower on that side of thing, as have most of the DHS components. Ma'am, uh, thank you for the question. And one of the things I've been acting in this job since January 20th, uh, Mr. Bob Fenton was the previous acting administrator. Uh, Mr. Long is now on board. Um, one of the things that Mr. Fenton and I did, and now Mr. Long and I have done, is we've conducted four agency-wide town hall meetings in the six months that, that I've been in this job. Um, that is more than we did in the previous year or two. Mr. Long has also initiated a plan to have uh, what he calls listening sessions in the next eight weeks with both our employees and our constituents that we work with. One of his intentions, one of Mr. Fenton's intentions and my own, was to reach out and talk to employees and the folks that we serve and find out what are we doing well. We want to replicate that. And where do we need to improve? And we want to work on that. But we want to hear it from the ground up. Uh, and we want to hear it from those that we serve. So that's an initiative that we've undertaken for the last several months, and we will continue to undertake. And I think that's terribly important. Uh, as Mr. Curry indicated, I think that engagement will help. One of, the, one of the factors that Mr. Long has clearly articulated in the month, maybe just under a month he's been here, is that he expects uh, leadership to get out from behind the desk and to go out and, and meet with the folks. I myself have walked Mr. Long through the entire building. Uh, we will walk up, talk to employees wherever they are, uh, 7 o'clock in the morning to 7 o'clock at night mm -hmm. and find out uh, how they're doing and what can we do to help them because, quite frankly, the work of the agency is done by those folks, uh, not honestly by us. Uh, those are the folks that are going out and meeting with the survivors and ensuring that our mission is being met. Uh, we have initiated a significant increase in our communication uh, and engagement. We hope in the long run that will help drive those uh, employee morale scores up. So uh, FEMA also took a beating in the aftermath of Katrina and Superstorm Sandy. And certainly, you know, I've been in this position for three years it, since I was the DA of my county when Superstorm Sandy happened. And one of the biggest issues we still face is people trying to recover from that. And the problem with the program there had really nothing to do with any of the FEMA employees. It had to do with the flood insurance program and how it was administered. And there is going to be major overhaul, we hope, in the future on that program at least. So to what extent um, does that have an effect on the morale, which, you know, those, the, what FEMA did in those two instances was really the, the, the workers, how quickly they responded and how much they helped people in the immediate aftermath of these tragedies, um, number one. Because if you look at, you know, the overall number of, 
what is it, 248 complaints annually related to alleged misconduct by FEMA personnel. It reflects less than 2% of the entire FEMA workforce. So, um, which I think is probably low on the low end for at least a lot of federal agencies. And they just seem to be the ones that get beat up all the time. So, you know, to what extent does well, that I have to do? I think one of the, uh, uh, one of the issues, I think, I think you're correct, when you are an agency like FEMA, uh, generally speaking, you're not in the press until a, a bad day happens. And when that bad day happens, it's a stressful, stressful situation for the communities, the localities, the public entities, but most importantly, for the private citizens that we serve. Uh, these are difficult times, and our employees do uh, work terribly hard, sometimes 18, 20-hour days in very difficult situations mm -hmm. where they themselves are often, you know, sleeping on a cot in a tent uh, to make sure that, the, that they can do their job. So that it is stressful. But actually, during those periods, our morale goes up because our people want to help. Mm -hmm. We have a first mentality responder um, a first, I'm sorry, a first responder mentality within our organization. And frankly, the busier we are, the higher the morale goes. Uh, can I mention, I, I, I would agree with that. I think the, the, the issues of morale um, at FEMA are not related to the mission. I think everyone there is bought into the mission and are there because of the mission. Um, I, I think where morale becomes a problem, and this happens across DHS components, we talk about this a lot at TSA and CBP and constantly being in the public limelight. Uh, the, the morale issues tend to creep in with, with leadership and supervision and how connected and trusting folks feel and supported they feel by their leadership. So the actions that Mr. Grant talked about that he and the new administrator are taking, town halls, trying to connect with officials, uh, trying to make employees a priority, just as much of a priority as the mission and not separate, because they're not separate, um, I think are, are great steps. Well, I, I agree right. with you. All right. I, 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 I agree with you, and but I think it all, you, you say morale all comes from the top, and if the President of the United States is not putting an emphasis Thank on you for the comment. federal workers. The, the oh, I'm sorry. Time has expired. The, time has expired. Thank you for your comment. You have got to be kidding me. I'd like to call on Ranking Member Correa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'd uh, like to ask you an unanimous consent to have Ms. Jackson Lee participate in the hearing. Without objection, so ordered. I thank the chairman for his courtesies, and I thank the ranking member for his leadership, and I thank Ms. Rice for a very consistent and thoughtful line of questioning. Um, I think she may have gotten her insight from being uh, one of the areas that experienced Hurricane Sandy and obviously engaged a lot with uh, FEMA staff uh, and making a very viable point uh, that, um, if I may use the terminology, commander-in-chief sets the tone all over the nation and really all over the world on how our federal employees are treated, including uh, in the last 24 hours how the United States military is treated. Uh, so uh, this hearing is a very vital hearing because if we as members of Congress can be helpful, I think it is important that we do so, that we do uh, what is constructive and uh, not do what undermines, uh, I think, a very able workforce. Now let me personally thank the entire FEMA workforce and emphasize that I believe they comply with the DHS mission with honor and integrity. We will safeguard the American people, our homeland, and our values. Let me say that I am uh, a, um, how should I say, beneficiary of, of FEMA's uh, good works. I am a hurricane victim, um, and I might not use that term in such that I ask for sympathy, uh, but I've been through any number of hurricanes and storms. Uh, if the chairman and the ranking member would allow me, uh, when my daughter was three years old, uh, in essence, we had to ship her off uh, to her grandparents because we were displaced for six weeks in what we call uh, Storm Allison some many years ago. Uh, the Texas Medical Center's major research was uh, eliminated uh, and uh, in a terrible disaster uh, during uh, that storm. And then successive storms from Rita to Katrina to Hurricane Ike, um, we have all been impacted in Houston and my constituents. And I say this to say because I want to applaud uh, the FEMA workers. And I know that there was a, a great episode with Hurricane Katrina with the leadership. But I can tell you that the FEMA workers uh, were uh, on the ground uh, working to try and overcome what the national image was. Uh, visiting with my colleague, 
uh, Congresswoman Sewell right after her election uh, with the terrible uh, tornadoes in Alabama. I saw FEMA workers on the ground. So to the FEMA workers, uh, including the reservists, let me thank you very much from a personal perspective. And maybe that's what we should be doing, is ensuring that they understand uh, the value that they serve for the American people. They are there before others are there, and they are there after others have gone. Uh, and so I particularly want to acknowledge your leadership um, that I've worked with in Washington and then on the ground. I want to take note of the reservists because I think we should understand that the reservists uh, come in and come out. That's a tough life. Uh, and so I'm going to ask a line of questioning. I also want to thank uh, Ms. Simon uh, and the president of the AFGE, uh, dear friends of mine. I don't mind saying it. Uh, I apologize. I have to step out to another meeting. But you already have me on record uh, as being uh, a chauvinist, if I may use that term, an advocate for all of you. Now let me quickly uh, try to, um, in, the, in the minutes I have left, uh, to be able to um, ask a question about follow-up. I want to know, uh, once an allegation of misconduct is made against a FEMA employee, what recourse does the employee have then to refute the allegation or appeal? And then, and both of you can answer, maybe it should be you, Mr. Um, Grant. And then uh, FEMA uses three separate offices as well as an administrative investigations committee to handle allegations of employee misconduct, which appear to average less than 300 cases per year. Does FEMA need to adjust or improve how employee misconduct is managed at the agency? That may be part of morale. There's no seamless way to, for these uh, employees to respond. Uh, and um, I want to know what kind of added benefits do you give? This is tough work. So morale goes about what incentives or benefits that you give uh, to make sure that they uh, are, in fact, um, rewarded for this very tough work. Because it's not, to the chairman and ranking member, it's not money. So if you can ask that and the chairman would indulge me for them to give their answer, I would greatly appreciate it. And I just want to be on record that the United States Congress in particular, uh, this member from uh, hurricane country, greatly appreciates the work that FEMA offices and FEMA staff does. Any misconduct should be corrected, but the work should be applauded. Would you answer those two questions, please? Uh, yes, ma'am. I will do my best to do so. Um, the first is that uh, I believe GAO did note that we have practice in place uh, that is consistently followed uh, to uh, review and adjudicate uh, each of the, each of the uh, uh, allegations that come up. Where we do not have adequate procedures in place is at the system level to make sure that they are captured in a unique uh, system. Uh, so what we've done is have a manual process where each of those three groups you mentioned uh, chief counsel, chief security officer, and chief human capital officer meeting labor relations will meet weekly to ensure that uh, issues do not fall between uh, the cracks. Unfortunately, that has occurred at times. Uh, as I indicated earlier, we are working with our partners at the IG to adopt their system uh, and deploy it across our enterprise as a sing singular sort of parent or umbrella system to ensure that we have uh, current, accurate, and complete records uh, for all cases with common nomenclature, common case management numbers, et cetera. We believe that will allow us to do the trend analysis that Mr. Correa asked about earlier in a more effective manner. Um, so I believe that answers most of your questions. The refuting, how does an employee refute? Oh, e at any time that an allegation is made against an employee, they are advised that they have the opportunity to meet with the investigation organization and refute that provide whatever information they deem necessary, and they're advised of their appeal rights should the decision go contrary to their belief. And thank you. Thank you for your answers. The, uh, uh, time, time's expired now. Thank you, Mr. So. Chairman. I, if I could just put this thank on the record for our answer in writing, I'd like to know how you work with AFGE for those employees that uh, have that uh, relationship with them. Yes, ma'am. I'd like that in writing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the ranking member. Thank, thank you. you. I yield back. Now I recognize Mr. Higgins for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for appearing before the subcommittee, and thank you for your service to our nation. Mr. Curry, my question is for you. Uh, how do FEMA's misconduct policies and procedures reflect best practices or internal control standards to ensure an efficient and effective organization? And specifically, it, while you reflect upon that, um, please 
give us some insight as to why did FEMA not promptly investigate certain cases referred by the Department of Homeland Security mm -hmm. Officer Inspector General? Mm -hmm. What was the effect of this delay? So yeah. give us some insight, please, onto your onto your your policies. Yes, sir. I think you used the, word, the the perfect wording, which is internal controls. I think that's the biggest problem we found in this process. Mr. Grant's talked about three separate systems collecting information on misconduct. When I say systems, don't think about IT systems. We're talking about spreadsheets here, manual spreadsheets. Um, and then a physical adjudication process to discuss those. So um, frankly, the data we presented in our report, we presented to give a sense of what we knew about misconduct cases, but it was not reliable, um, which is why we had several findings and recommendations to strengthen the data. So. Um, I'm not inferring that they were, uh, it was understated or overstated. We just, we just don't feel good about the data. I'm not sure if that was comprehensive or not. So the controls are, are critical. If you don't have a system to track it and monitor it, then you have no idea whether you're following up. The other part of that is um, this, the, the, the process of uh, the complaint coming in and the adjudication and disciplinary action are separate, and those don't track through the process. So we couldn't go back and find out if there was disciplinary action taken in all allegations or not, and why, because the system's just, the data was just kind of a mess. So uh, it, in the IG issue, um, it, it's the same issue. Um, and this is not just an issue for FEMA. Um, other DHS components, TSA and CBP, we found similar issues. They are supposed to communicate constantly with the IG, and, and some of these components are getting thousands of cases. Um, and so there just has to be a better system to automatically communicate and track the cases between the IG uh, and the component. And I think the burden is, is really on the component to make sure they're not missing the cases, because the IG gets you know, 15 to 20,000 cases a year. So you're saying that, that, that it's very difficult for you to track whether or not disciplinary action has been taken at some other, some other stage within we, the agency or within some, some well, we context we, of the agency? FEMA provided us data on the number of disciplinary actions it took and what those actions were. What we couldn't do is track them to each case all throughout the process from allegation to investigation to adjudication and disciplinary action because the systems were just different. Are case files not created that for, on each individual investigation it, into misconduct within it, the Department of Homeland Security? Case files are created, but mostly manually and in, inputted into a system. But and do telephones not get answered from one supervisor to another or from the director to a supervisor? Is there... Well, the, can can people not, people not allow to talk to each other? Absolutely, and, and FEMA has a process for for handling these cases and what supervisors and employees are supposed to do. As Mr. Grant said, it's just you know that that may not always happen. Mr. Grant, you have something to add there, sir? Uh, yes, sir. I think uh, the of the six recommendations that uh, Mr. Curry and his report indicated or provided us, we agree with them all. Uh, we do do case management. We identify each case. We track it through the system. We do not have a system, a singular system, as I indicated earlier, in place that would allow a unique case identifier number. Each of those three systems have different nomenclatures, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we have to meet manually each week to make sure that each office is on the same page. It is inefficient. It is, uh, allows for opportunity for mistakes to be made. Um, that's why we are adopting, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Department of uh, Homeland Security's Inspector General has a system. We are testing that system in our environment right now. We are going to pilot it in our chief security office. That is the office that most closely uh, interacts with the Inspector General. That will ensure that we are using the same nomenclature, the same case numbering they have. Once we establish that in our architecture and it works, we will then deploy it across FEMA. So all of the offices involved in this process will be using the same parent system. I believe that will, that will take care of many of the issues raised by GAO. Thank you, gentlemen. It, 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 it appears that the creation of a solid case file with an identifying number that would gradually uh, build upon itself with supplemental reports mm -hmm. as cases of misconduct are investigated could be quite beneficial to the efficiency of your procedure. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Now the Chair would like to thank the witnesses for their valued full testimony and the members for their questions. Uh, the first panel is now excused, and the clerk will prepare the witness table for the next panel. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Chair will now introduce our witness for the second panel. Ms. Jacqueline Simon is Director for the Public Policy Department at the American Federation of Government Employees, AFGE. AFGE is the largest federal employee union representing 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers. AFGE provides its members with legal representation, legislative advocacy, technical expertise, and informational services. Thank you for being here today. And now the chair recognizes Ms. Simon for an opening statement. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Korea, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. GAO's report takes pains to explain the numerous distinct types of employment tenure at FEMA. First are Title V employees who are both permanent and temporary workers, hired only after a rigorous and competitive merit-based examination process, one that includes the application of veterans' preference. FEMA employees who are covered by Title V are afforded full civil service protections, and where the workers have voted to form a union are covered by a collective bargaining agreement as well. Stafford Act employees, on the other hand, are hired only for temporary or term employment appointments. They do not undergo rigorous vetting through competitive examination, and they're employed at will and may be terminated at any time for any reason or no reason and have no rights of appeal and no due process protections. FEMA also employs surge capacity force volunteers who are otherwise employed by the Department of Homeland Security. They're deployed in the case of catastrophic disaster. Finally, there's the FEMA Corps National Service Program, whose members uh, are fewer than 500 and are part of the AmeriCorps program. These distinctions matter. Under Title V, employees are subject to well-defined disciplinary procedures and penalties, and they have the right to appeal adverse actions, either through grievance and arbitration procedures in their collective bargaining agreements where applicable, or through access to the MSPB. FEMA Corps members have a disciplinary process that is determined by the AmeriCorps program. Surge capacity force volunteers have no documented misconduct policies and are presumed to be referred back to their home component for action. Stafford Act employees, reservists and Corps employees, make up a second-class workforce at FEMA. They're described by GAO as having poorly defined or non-existent disciplinary processes and no rights of appeal for adverse actions. It is the lack of policy or procedures to address misconduct and appeal rights for this segment of FEMA's workforce that makes up the heart of GAO's report. Let's start with the numbers. The average annual number of employee misconduct complaints for 2016 amounted to less than 2% of all employees. Of the complaints filed within the three-year period under examination, the agency's actions were decisive. 65% of the accused were terminated, 21% received reprimands, and 12% received suspensions. This appears, to me, to be a system at work. Allegations were investigated and the agency responded, and importantly, about 12% of those investigated were found innocent, and we must remember that these innocents are why we have due process. The result of GAO's efforts to research and report the policies in place to handle allegations of misconduct among FEMA workers is the realization that no consistent process exists for, at all for anyone other than Title V employees. If there's a problem with investigating misconduct at FEMA, AFGE believes that the reason is the overabundance of at-will employees. These workers have not been hired competitively, their backgrounds, skills, and qualifications have not been rigorously tested, and it seems as though they receive neither adequate training nor adequate supervision. Most important from the standpoint of the concerns about integrity addressed in the GAO report, because they lack the protection of a union contract and the right to appeal adverse actions such as suspensions and terminations, their whistleblower protections are entirely pro forma and thus ineffective. Corruption is an ever-present danger when the government is providing assistance after a disaster. There are cash transfers, direct provision of goods and services, and procurement decisions that all present risk. For those who either don't have clear policy and supervision or are vulnerable to pressure from corrupt supervisors or managers to engage in misappropriation, there's danger of being charged with inappropriate behavior. FEMA is therefore the last agency that should ever be staffed by an at-will workforce with no collective bargaining rights and no avenue of appeal for adverse action by managers. There should be no surprise that there are allegations of impropriety in a workforce that is so much at the mercy of managers. 
If this sub subcommittee is truly interested in providing the public with well-trained, qualified, and accountable emergency workers, then the current practice of hiring reservists and Corps employees at will should end. Rather, the entire emergency workforce at FEMA should be hired under Title V authorities. This will ensure they are properly vetted, trained, and disciplined, and protect the public from potential financial or political corruption. This concludes my statement. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Simon. And now the chair recognizes himself for five minutes of questioning. I mean, do you believe that having the documented misconduct policies and procedures for, for the all FEMA workforce categories would help improve the perception that uh, FEMA is being able to treat their cases uh, uh, adequately and equally? Yes, but, but when there's an at-will workforce, there's no need to use any procedures. Um, people can just be fired for not towing the line. But if we had, but are you, are you thinking that, that that adequate or consistent policies couldn't address some of that, even if you had a policy for that will workforce versus uh, uh, hired under the Stafford Act versus uh, other under Title V? Well, the government has access to a system that's demonstrably working, and that's the systems that are described in Title V. Um, that's why I've argued that uh, the procedures in Title V should be applied to the entire FEMA workforce, particularly emergency workers, not particularly necessarily, but to all workers. Uh, and um, that is the best uh, protection uh, for the public fist for in, in a situation uh, involving an emergency. I, uh, and, and, and part of my question is around that centers around I mean, in my past life as state treasurer, uh, I had both employees that were un under the the uh, classified as well as non-classified positions, and and uh, I think we were able to effectively make that work for both both classification of employees, even though they were they were actually technically some different criteria in how you worked with them. But uh, you know, having good management practices seemed to address some of those things. Well, of course, if you don't, if when, where management is not corrupt, uh, you don't have this problem. But um, what our responsibility is to protect the public from the potential of, of corruption. Um, another question is, I mean, FEMA recently has been using the comparators spreadsheet to determine the range of disciplinary actions and, and table of offenses. And due to some of the personal information maintained on that, uh, only certain management were able to see that spreadsheet. Uh, do you think it would be beneficial for the entire FEMA workforce to have better transparency in, in terms of the range of offenses and penalties? Well, I think that this question of using the comparators as opposed to a table of penalties is complex, and there are arguments on both sides. Um, on the one hand, uh, a table of penalties, in, in theory, uh, provides consistency. Um, but you raise questions with privacy and, um, uh, you know, uh, having the comparators of, of what kinds of uh, uh, discipline have actually been applied in similar situations might, in theory, uh, produce even more consistency than a table of penalties that gives you a range of possibilities. Um, I think that's why there was a move from the table of penalties to the uh, comparators. Um, I, personally, I, I cut down on the side of the table of penalties. All right. Thank you. And now I'd like to recognize Ranking Member Korea for five minutes of Christine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Simon, first of all, welcome and thank you for being here. As I listen to my colleagues and their testimony, I'm reminded that I'm from Southern California, Los Angeles, Orange County. and. Uh, Back in the early 90s, I was actually there to witness. I was part of that little earthquake that hit us and uh, stopped cold about 10 million people. Um, it was the first time in my life I actually thought I was going to die. Uh, it, was, it was a horrific situation, and the aftermath was what's quite something in seeing FEMA there. Uh, again, I thank all of you for being there at our uh, most critical uh, moment in our life. And... The aftermath, all the stories of fake insurance companies coming in, uh, people trying to make a buck off other people's disaster, and the stories of corruption uh, were countless. And, and uh, 
you remind me when you talk about risk of corruption, um, part-time employees. I imagine that these uh, at-will employees that we're talking about, are they employees that are essentially brought in when you have a surge? Is that what it is? Yes. A and um, what I'm hearing you say, and I don't want to put any words in your mouth, is uh, these are the folks that probably need to be at the front lines in terms of having the ability to blow the whistle when they see corruption happening at the grassroots level. Because it doesn't, didn't do any of my neighbors and friends any good to figure out that they're actually being duped a month or two after their money had been taken away. So I guess trying to follow up with the chairman's line of questioning with you is, uh, would you say then that you want to bring in these temporary employees as under collective bargaining to give them the protection so they can uh, call out the corruption at either management or outside of FEMA during these you know, moments of crisis? Absolutely, yes. Um, a, a strong collective bargaining um, agreement with uh, protection against uh, retaliation for blowing the whistle is the best protection the public can have um, for, to make sure that taxpayer dollars are being handled in a way that uh, uh, is uh, consistent with with uh, the public good. Um, you, we have data across the government in every agency that shows um, the whistleblowers who come forward with the uh, are, with the strongest protections are those covered by a collective bargaining agreement. And as you describe, uh, disasters, intense disasters, where there is a lot of money floating around, money and chaos, uh, money and chaos, and hurt and pain. That is a moment when you want to have the strongest possible protections, uh, especially for the front frontline employees, because there it's inevitable that there will be pressure placed upon them um, by those who are in that chain of of uh, possession of the money and making decisions about distribution of the money. Uh, they need to be held to account. Those managers need to be held to account. And if, if the frontline employees are completely subject to the whim of those who are supervising them, you've got a recipe for corruption. A follow-up question. Um, I'm very concerned with some of the testimony from the prior panel and, and you as well. This lack of trust at upper levels of management. Can you get any more specific? Because again, FEMA, in my opinion, you're, you are frontline responders. Uh, your mission is an important one. I think morale has to be the driving force. If you really love your job, and your job is to go into very, uh, very terrible places. And so why is it that you have lack of trust at the upper level and therefore low morale? How do you fix that? Well... I think there's Speculate, a lot of Speculate, please. <laughs> it's hard. You know, I, I think that Representative Rice was certainly on to something um, when she discussed uh, the attacks on the federal workforce. That certainly lowers, uh, lowers morale, uh, not only in the Department of Homeland Security and all its components, but across the government. Um, when it comes to lack of trust, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to... Do you feel that. you're attacked as a workforce? Uh, certainly. Uh, when it comes to the pay and benefits and the uh, quality of their work, the threats to, to dismantle programs and, and eliminate jobs, uh, the questioning of the quality of, of uh, federal employees' work constantly, yes, we, we very much feel under, under attack. And um, I think we, we see that in the federal employee uh, viewpoint survey. Very quickly, how does that translate to lack of trust in upper management? Well. There are two sort of streams of upper management. One is political appointees, and other are career managers. Uh, when political appointees follow the federal, you know, attack the federal workforce line, that's a problem. Um, you know, I, I think that um, there's been a lot of rhetoric in this Congress about how uh, we need to uh, make it easier to fire a federal employee, and federal employees are always presumed to be uh, 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 poor performers and um, and um, and, and somehow a, a drain on the taxpayer um, rather than providing valuable services to the American public. And to the degree that uh, you know, managers continue to, to repeat that rather than to praise the, the good work that federal employees do and express appreciation for how much they do with very, very modest compensation, you've got a, you've got a problem. 
Thank you, Ranking Member Correa. And now I'd like to call on Mr. Higgins for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Simon, thank you for appearing before this subcommittee, and thank you for your service to your nation. Thank you. Um, reading your testimony and listening to you speak, you're an intelligent and passionate representative for, for your, your cause. But is it your suggestion that, that uh, the solution to the problems at FEMA, uh, including during disaster response, be they man-made or natural, the solutions to the problems would be that 100 percent of the employees of FEMA, full-time and part-time, should be union employees? Well, I, I was, uh, my testimony focused exclusively on the uh, subject of the GAO report that was published last week, um, not the, you suggest not the that, question that of all of FEMA's problems. That the at-will employees, are they union employees? Uh, no, they are not. And, and you're, they are not covered you're suggesting by the agreement. That they should be union employees. They should be better trained and under, under union control. They, you specifically suggest that they need union protections uh, regarding their employment status, and so that they can be their 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 quote unquote whistleblowing will be more effective. Absolutely, uh, union a union contract as well as the provisions of uh, of Title V civil service protection. So, Respectfully, I ask you if if we staffed FEMA with 100 percent response capable employees at at that level, at that were union employees, what would they do when they were not responding to a, a disaster? Oh, uh, the union can represent uh, workers who are employed only um, in a surge capacity. Uh, the union can certainly represent temporary employees and term employees. You don't have to be a full-time permanent um, employee in order to be covered by a collective bargaining agreement. Intelligent response. Uh, I, I represent a South Louisiana district. In August of last year, uh, our citizens suffered what was referred to as epic flooding, a thousand-year flooding, with 56 inches of rain in just a couple of days. Uh, the water management systems uh, were overwhelmed. Uh, rivers overflowed their, their levees, et cetera. Uh, tens of thousands, scores of thousands of homes and businesses were flooded. And may I respectfully suggest to you to consider the fact that during that flooding, in the immediate aftermath, uh, before FEMA was on the ground, a volunteer staff of thousands and thousands of South Louisiana citizens, churches, volunteer groups, formed what was called a Cajun Navy and a supply chain. Tens of thousands of people were rescued from flooded homes and rooftops. Hundreds of tons, perhaps thousands of tons of food and clothing and shelter were distributed by volunteer staff uh, before FEMA was on the ground. Those guys are not certainly union employees. So would you please, would you please clarify for this subcommittee the, the disparity of what I just described, an actual, effective, practical response by real American citizens working for themselves for free for their fellow citizen and, and had largely addressed the emergency status of the flooding before FEMA was on the ground? I think volunteerism is is wonderful, and it's it's part of citizenship, and it's part of um, what uh, any humane response would be to a to a disaster. So I'm very glad that uh, the people of your community uh, were beneficiaries of uh, of volunteerism. Well, thank you for your response, ma'am. Mr. Chairman, uh, I yield the balance of my time. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Berrigan. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I'm still trying to make the connection on how the volunteers that came out ties into the GAO report on how to, which is what we're here to hear about, the um, how to improve the situation at FEMA. Um, I. When when Hurricane Katrina hit, I was one of those volunteers. I was a lawyer. I flew out to Biloxi, Mississippi, to help people file their insurance claims. 
And I did it because I had a certain skill that I think I could provide um, and wanted to just help. And I, I think that's a very different situation than what I did in my full-time job or what anybody would do in their full-time job. Um, and so I, um, I am also grateful for the volunteers we have. But in this situation, I think we have employees um, who are working at FEMA and kind of hearing your testimony today about um, why you believe that uh, the at-will relationships provides, um, I guess, less protections and um, like some hesitation maybe on the part of employees to come forward. Um, as somebody who's actually served as an employment lawyer before, um, I can understand this firsthand. As an employee, I can understand that as well um, when you are reluctant to, to kind of come forward. Um, I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about um, if you have testimonials from empl employees uh, maybe that were at will who were hesitant to come forward because of that relationship and how it would have, they may have come forward because if they, if they had some protection that they would have come forward. Uh, well, thank you for the question. I um, I don't have those kinds of testimonials. Um, uh, and to my knowledge, uh, no one um, who's part of the at-will workforce at FEMA has come to AFGE um, asking for assistance or advice. Um, we do get um, people who are in our bargaining units come to us for uh, legal advice and assistance when they are preparing to come forward um, with a whistleblower, uh, as whistleblowers. Um, and, and we, you know, we advise them, um, especially in the context of, of retaliation, um, which happens more often than anybody would like to believe mm -hmm. in federal agencies. Um, but we never hear from, these are the people we never hear from. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, you know they're just part, they become part of the statistics on on uh, termination. Right. Um, we don't know. We never get the story, and we never have a third an objective third party to hear the evidence that okay. they would bring forward. And I, the, and the reason I asked was my sister happens to be a federal employee, um, and she has actually come to me before with stories of people who are at will and saying you know people want to come forward but they don't because they're concerned about it. And I was just curious if you had heard any of those stories because they've certainly have heard some of those and understand um, what it means when you have those collective bargaining rights. Mm -hmm. Having um, come from a labor household all my life, um, I've seen firsthand what the difference could be um, when you are trying to make sure to report some misconduct or in this case, uh, the, some of the, you know, any issues of corruption that may be happening, especially during a time of crisis. Um, just to clarify, um, do you believe that the table of penalties would be beneficial to a FEMA workforce? I, before I answer that question, I would have to see a lot more information than what was provided in the GAO report. Um, I, I, of course, do not have access to the comparators. Um, I think that you know the question of privacy was raised with regard to the comparators. Um, the question becomes, you know, when, to what degree to, does management have discretion um, when there's a range of um, penalties that can be applied in a certain situation, and. Um, I'm not sure that the, the difference between the table of penalties and the comp, uh, comparator system is as enormous as, as it might be, you know, presumed to be. Um, but you know, the, the discretion and the range is is where you get in inconsistency. Um, on the other hand, you know, just a, a cookbook that gives absolutely no opportunity for. Um, you know, mitigation of penalties um, on the part of a supervisor to say, well, you know, there were circumstances that justify a, a, a less harsh penalty or, or, you know, the harshest penalty. Uh, there, there's an argument to be made for the discretion too, but I haven't seen enough data to really give a good answer. Okay, thank you. I yield back. Chair, thanks to the lady, Ms. Simon, I regret, and I apologize for not being here for your testimony. Um, that having been said, uh, I just have a couple questions for you and, and I'm hoping maybe they're, they're germane to what you know as opposed to the other witnesses. According to GAO's report, 
uh, OSCO or the Office of Chief Security has not established an effective procedure to ensure that all cases referred to FEMA by DHS OIG are counted for and subsequently reviewed and addressed. And indeed, according to the report, there were some that were uh, referred and and uh, and then sent back and then never adjudicated. What what is the effect uh, on the po employee population, if you know from your experience? when these things go unaddressed is the best way to ask it. I mean, I guess, do, I mean, does, do, is, is, does anybody care? Is there, is there an effect? Because in my mind, somebody probably either was wrongly accused or wrongly um, got away with something, for lack of a better way to put it. And I imagine in any organization that has an effect, but I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Um. Of course, I mean, I, I don't know anything about um, specific cases. Um, I can just speak generally to the question. And um, of course, uh, you know, everyone wants um, a federal government that is run with the highest st standards of integrity. And um, no one wants to tolerate um, corruption. Uh, and no one <laughs> likes to see a manager or a low-level employee get away with something that um, uh, he or she should not get away with and go unpunished, and no one likes to see inconsistency. So when there are cases that are not dealt with, um, that are, you know, uh, swept under the carpet, of course, um, nobody's happy about that. But I don't have any actual knowledge of specific cases. Do you, do you think, do you view it, do employees view it as corruption, incompetence, a broken system, too many things going, do you know, how, well, how do people view that? I can't really give you a clear answer because the range of um, allegations is so um, so broad, and um, you know allegations can be lodged in all kinds of situations. Sometimes there's a personality conflict. Um, sometimes uh, you know sometimes there's smoke. Sometimes and and no fire. And sometimes there really is a, a an issue. And and so that's why it is so important. Um, as I testified, to have a procedure where an objective third party weighs evidence, and we don't have that for the reservist and core workforce. Um, they can simply be terminated with no, um, no consideration of evidence. Well, we're concerned on both sides of the equation. We don't want people falsely accused. However, we don't want things to go unadjudicated for the sake of the taxpayer, for the sake of the employees, for the sake of the agency and, and its reputation. Uh, all those things are important, and um, I, I appreciate your your insight. Uh, I have a curiosity uh, that uh, that came to my mind during the previous testimony, and I get to ask those folks, so I'm, I'm going to ask you if you know. Um, the volunteers, and I guess that's the reserve force, right, that comes into place when there's a disaster. They come from other agencies of their own volition, but they cannot be disciplined by FEMA if they are uh, found to be have, have done something incongruent with the codes of conduct and standards, et cetera. Uh, and I'm wondering if that has to do with an administrative process, if you know, or if that has to do with a collective bargaining agreement that this employee might have with his normal employer or her normal employer as opposed to the time they're at, F at, at FEMA. And I just, uh, from my standpoint as a military officer, when I would get a, a, a soldier or service member from another organization to work in my organization, there was a status for that individual that I knew, or the unit that I knew, I either had tactical control so I could order them to go do whatever I needed to do, and their, their owning or parent unit um, provided their logistics and their uh, uh, UCMJ, the Code of Military Justice, whatever, or they were what we would call operational control. I own them for the period of time. I write their evaluation, I order them, I feed them, I clothe them, I adjudicate their, uh, you know, if there's a problem. So I'm just wondering if, if you know if this is an administrative oversight or if there's, a, if there's a rationale or a problem, a roadblock that has to do with collective bargaining, multiple bargaining agreements or what have you. Do you know? Well, two things. Um, I'm not 100% certain, but my recollection um, reading the GAO report, that segment of the workforce didn't have any kind of um, allegations of, of impropriety or misconduct um, that had been adjudicated. Um, there were no, but, but the answer to your question is no, that it's not the collective bargaining agreement, on, um, uh, not at all. Um, they, they were you know, sort of on loan. Uh, this workforce is on loan. Um, 
to FEMA from other components, mostly of DHS, and they're referred back to their employing agency, um, and it's up to the agency. Remember, discipline is, is a management responsibility. So if the employing agency uh, doesn't uh, follow through and investigate and, and, and ultimately discipline, um, that's not the fault of the collective bargaining agreement. That's a management failure. Well, I would agree with you unless there's something that inhibits no. the management from, from taking action. I, and I'm well past my time here, but uh, I appreciate your input. And uh, I just, I, I think uh, from an editorial standpoint, I think it's, it'd be hard as a manager to be able to exact discipline on somebody that uh, that I didn't have jurisdiction over that could go back to their parent agency, for lack of a better term, and and, and claim ignorance or what have you, and then that agency doesn't take any action. And, and yeah. I, but I, I I also accept, and I don't because I don't know whether these individuals had involved in any been involved in any of the infractions. And it's great if they haven't. I think not. But even so, I think it's important that that there is a system in place for instances because even though there are volunteers and we appreciate their service and taking time away from what they do they are they are uh, representing FEMA at at a critical time when all eyes are on FEMA and and, uh, and and so we must have we must be ensured of their integrity and their work ethic and and uh, and everything that goes with that I agree with you I think it probably should be uh, 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 FEMA's um FEMA should have the opportunity to, to handle these issues. Appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. The chair thanks you, Ms. Simon, and all the witnesses for their very valuable testimony and the members for their questions. Members may have some additional questions for the witness, and we will ask uh, you to respond as witnesses in writing. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7D, the hearing record will remain open for 10 days without objection. The subcommittee stands adjourned.